Well, Dream City Church, it is an honor to preach to you this morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ash Matesius. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. And I'm very excited for the word that the Lord has blessed me with this morning. I had a very fun day yesterday. Some of the tribe uh, young men's ministry went paintballing yesterday, which I thought I'd be a lot better at, to be honest. I thought I would be a lot better at, and in fact, because one of the only few people I hit, I did headshot him. It was a pretty epic shot, except for the fact that he was on my team. (laughs) So... The only guy I really managed to get out was on my team, and he's actually in the lobby right now. You can see Duncan with a giant welt on his head. And the worst part is I actually felt, you know, decently impressed. I was like, you know what? If I didn't get anybody out, at least I team killed my friend the best way possible. (laughs) But we're in the final installment of our Blessed or Stressed series. And I hope this series has been very, uh, I love this series every year, because each and every year I find that there's junk that stuck to me from the prior year that I want to leave behind and outgrow. Is anybody else there with me? No matter what happens in this life, there's just something that just creeps its way on you, perhaps a negative word, a negative memory, a negative event that you just want to shed. And so I always love the beginning series every year to just recalibrate everything we have. But before I dive into the word this morning, could you guys please bow your heads and join me in a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the word that you gave me. Holy Spirit, I pray that as my mouth opens up, let it be your word that comes out, your word with the power to heal, your word the power to restore, to to bind up demons, God, to get a new story, a new beginning. In Jesus' name, I pray that those in this crowd can hear your word, that they might act upon it. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. For those of you taking notes this morning, the title of my sermon is called Power of Attorney. Power of Attorney. That's just like a funny phrase. I don't know why this was the title. It's just what came in my head, so I believe God ordained it. That's just the type of faith that I have this morning. Come on, somebody. But Power of Attorney is described as the authority to act for another person in specified or all legal or financial manners. Essentially saying, I can work for you on your behalf. This definition of power attorney saying, I can do these things for you on your behalf if you would let me, if you would allow it, if you would advocate for it to happen, I can essentially fight these battles for you. See that you allow someone to speak, act, and move on your behalf. The Bible has another method similar to power of attorney, which is found throughout scripture, but it's highlighted in a passage from 1 Timothy 2. We're going to read that together this morning. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 6. It'll be on the screen behind me. Paul's writing to Timothy, he says, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there's one God, and there's one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. What a powerful verse. So Paul here is writing to Timothy, who's leading the church in the Greek city of Ephesus, which is now in modern day Turkey. Timothy's a young leader, and Paul's writing this letter to not only encourage him, but inspire him on how to lead, on how to lead people, on how to lead a congregation, on how to lead his city. For those of you who don't fully uh, kind of understand the heart of a pastor, it's, it's, yes, it's about a church and a people, but it's about a city. God called Pastor Tommy Barnett to this city. God called my father to the city of San Diego. God called my wife and I to the city of Phoenix. There's something so much deeper about prayer, about leading, than just here on a Sunday. It's about winning a city. Paul tells Timothy that he should pray for all people. But more than that, he should try and give intercession for all people. But what's intercession? What does that mean? Some of us might have heard that term, intercession, intercessory prayer. Uh, but the definition for intercessory prayer, one of the most basic definitions is the act of prayer on behalf of others. The act of prayer on behalf of others. To pray for someone other than yourself. To pray as if you were standing in between them and God pleading their case. To pray as if you are directly in the middle of what they're going through and stood in the middle between them and God and had the ability to carry the word of God to them. Had the ability to bring that word directly to God for them. One of the best imagery that came to my head as I was preparing the sermon was an attorney, someone who stands between the client and the judge, ratifying their case, speaking the word directly to Almighty God. That leads us to point number one this morning. Point number one, point number one, point number one. Prayer frees and prayer saves. Point number one is prayer frees and prayer saves. When we pray, we pray for God to grab a hold of people's hearts most oftentimes. God, just get a hold of his heart. God, get a hold of his heart. God, get a hold of his heart. But there's... 
no better example of God using prayer, talking to someone to get a hold of someone's heart than a story found in Acts chapter nine with a character in the Bible named Ananias. I'm gonna have the scripture up behind me. Well, I'm gonna read it this morning. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. So what I love about this story is that a lot of us might have heard the story of, of Paul, one of the greatest apostles in all of scripture, as he was going to Damascus to go and ransack one of the churches and throw people in jail. He encounters God in the form of a blinding light and he's blind. Everybody around him hears what's going on, but they can't see it. They don't have the same vision that Paul had. And Paul is led into a city and he prays to God and God says to Paul, I'm gonna send a man named Ananias to heal you. Well, that's just great for Paul. But then we get the story from Ananias. Ananias is praying. He's being a good little Christian man. He's, you know, going to 21 days of prayer. He's praying for a prayer card. And out of nowhere, God speaks to him and he says, Ananias. And he's like, oh, here we go, baby. My time has come to make the history books. God's gonna speak to me and give me a thing that I'm gonna be famous for. He says, you probably heard of this guy named Saul. And he's like, yeah, he's the worst. <laughs> he's killing all my friends. I've actually heard that he was blind. I think it's a great thing. God, you answer prayers every day. You took out our enemy. And God says, yeah, right, right, right. But I want you to go find him. He's like, and kill him. He's like, no, no, no. I want you to go find him. I want you to lay your hands on his face so that he can see again. And Ananias is just like, hmm, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> he says, God, I've heard about this guy. How could I not have heard about this man who's been killing all of your believers, all of your saints, and you're wanting me to go help him? He says, I think I'm listening to the wrong voices. He says, hello. He says, this can't be God because God likes to make sense. And God says, I'm sending you to him because you're the only person he believes is coming to help him. And if you can help him, the breakthrough that's in store in his life is immeasurable. So the story goes that Ananias goes to Saul's house. Saul's expecting him. He prays over himself. Saul immediately gets his vision and Saul immediately wants to get baptized into the faith of Jesus Christ. What a powerful, powerful picture of intercessory prayer. Since Ananias agreed to obey God and intercede for Saul, Saul could not get the answer on his own. Another Christian, a man who was willing to be used by God, had to move in the path of Saul and get Saul access to God. That's what intercessory prayer is. Intercede for Saul, the chief Pharisee. It enabled God to heal Saul's heart and turn him to Paul for the kingdom of God. One of the most profound aspects is when we get into heaven and we can see the tally in everybody's names of, man, this guy saved this many people. Pastor Tommy's got like a million tallies, you know? And that's just incredible. You're like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. You're gonna get to Paul and you're gonna see that Paul has all of these tallies. You're gonna say, this guy was incredible. And you're gonna see that right next to Paul, you're gonna see Ananias. And he's gonna have all those tallies and one more. Because Ananias will get the credit in heaven. If you did not do this, this could have never happened that Paul owes his spiritual foundation to Ananias. Ananias goes down in the history books as the man who ushered in the spirit of Paul. But when I would first started in ministry years ago, as a young man, as a young testosterone-filled man, come on somebody, I would often say to myself in my thoughts that if a politician came in from a political party I disagreed with, I would just hammer him with the truth, <laughs> right? The whole truth, nothing but the truth. You know, because there's nothing wrong with the truth. That's what the Bible says. I'd wanna make him squirm a little bit. I wouldn't say anything that wasn't truthful, but I'd make sure they felt the heat of God. That's kind of where my headspace was at when I first started in the ministry. But I'll never forget that after reading this story years ago, that God gave me the question, he said, I know how on fire you are for the truth and that the truth sets people free and the truth is what's most important. But what if you treat, preach the truth of God wrapped in the grace of God that could lead them to accepting me? He said, wouldn't that cause greater things to happen than scratching an itch or stroking an ego? 
I began to realize that as good as it might feel to turn the heat on people, and there's a time and a place for that, that I began to realize that it's far greater for pray, to pray that someone in authority would turn to God because what happens in revival is inevitable. If some of these politicians, some of these leaders, some of these people in authority we don't like, if they turn to God, friends, revival's inevitable. Revival would be inevitable. Revival would be inevitable. The entire book of Daniel is laced with this idea. Daniel was a Jewish man living in Babylon, one of the worst uh, uh, lands in, in all of biblical history. Foreign, wicked, sinful kings were all so impressed with Daniel that they began to worship God. Every single time Daniel would answer dreams or survive miracles or be survived in a den of lions, the kings would have no other explanation but turning their hearts to God. Because Daniel was willing to stand in front of them and preach the truth of God. You see, the book of Daniel says that worshiping the Lord became the main direction of the country. Babylon, people in Babylon were worshiping God, that the believers of God would have no doubt been blessed in this country also because Daniel was willing to intercede for the people. Because Daniel's willing to say, rather than condemning these politicians, elites, and kings, and sometimes the truth needs to do that, what happens if they joined our side? What happens if they were for the kingdom of God? One of my favorite heroes, one of my man crushes in recent weeks, as you can talk to my wife, she's probably sick of me talking about this guy, is John Wesley. I've got a photo of him attached. John Wesley is one of the greatest theologians to ever live and one of the mightiest prayer warriors to ever live. He's a profound example of what happens when authority comes to know the Lord. While on a crusade in America, John Wesley saw firsthand the horrors of American slavery. After reading the horrible accounts of what happens to slaves uh, by American abolitionist Anthony Benizé, he began to call for the complete end of human slavery, not just in America, but across the globe. He wrote a book about how it needed to end and, and, and inciting man's innate freedom from God as something we shouldn't mess with. John Wesley knew that by reading his Bible that man was never meant to rule or dominate fellow man. That is one thing humans have gotten wrong since its inception. Man was never meant to rule other man. They were both meant to serve God together. But arguably the most powerful writing was one of his last writings he ever wrote. Near the time John Wesley would die, he wrote a letter to a young British person named William Wilberforce. I've got a photo of William Wilberforce attached also. William Wilberforce was one of the youngest parliament members in all of England, and he had the potential for greatness. He was young, he was intelligent, he was wealthy, he had influence, affluence, and he had the ability to change history. John Wesley knew the power of intercession so well, of praying for those in authority to see the light and wisdom of God. And so he wrote William Wilberforce a personal letter encouraging him to fight the good fight of faith. He said this, I got it quoted. He's, uh, John Wesley said this to William Wilberforce. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you'll be worn out by the opposition of man and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them together stronger than God? Oh, be not weary of well-doing, go on. In the name of God and in the power of his might till even American slavery shall vanish away before it. John Wesley told this young politician, he said, bro, you are fighting an uphill battle, but did you know with God on your side, when you go to God, it doesn't matter how many enemies, how many obstacles are before you, their combined strength falls to God. John Wesley spent his last letter not condoning the sin, not condoning these people, not getting all of his hate mail out, not saying, I'm gone in a week, I'm gonna just go out in a blaze of glory. He sent his last letter to inspire and intercede for people. William Wilberforce spent majority of his political career seeking to end one of the greatest evils of human history, which is human slavery. In 1833, the Slavery Abolition Act was signed into law by British Parliament, and one of the greatest evils was defeated. Friends, I've got to tell you, don't listen to the lies, don't listen to the fake news that Christianity condones or Christianity started slavery. Don't listen to those lies. Christianity didn't start slavery, but Christianity ended slavery because of the wonderful men and women of God who believed in the power of intercession. Can I get an amen in the house of God? Christianity was not its start, is what's not a reason for it to keep going, but it was absolutely the reason that it ended because these people understood that when they read their Bible, they can't help but think and see and understand that God has made all men equal. Friends, we serve a good, good God. When we pray, when we go to God with what's on our hearts, freedom ensues. Prayer frees and prayer saves. The best thing in life you can possibly do is bring your heart's call to God. The worst thing in life you could possibly do is keep your heart's call away from God. Because in God's hands, anything can happen. The worst thing that can happen is your life stays the exact same. 
<laughs> but the best thing that can happen is God gets a hold of everything and turns it for his good. You see, that's why we pray for our family and friends. Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest evangelists, known as the Prince of Preachers, would always encourage his disciples to pray for their families to find God. He would say, if your family is saved, then praise God and say, God, thank you so much. I pray that they truly do love you. And Charles Spurgeon would then say, if your family's away from God, well, then there's nothing short of a prayer request you can't say right now. He says, if your family's away from God, there really is a day you shouldn't stop praying. There's a never ending amount of prayer requests you can give to God. See, when Paul first wrote Timothy, uh, first wrote in 1 Timothy 2.2 2, that we should intercede for kings and politicians, he could have never imagined the effect it would have on the world 1,800 years later to free humanity and save humanity from the powers of sin. We can't ever neglect the power and authority God has given us to steward our land well. We need to pray for those in authority, that God would get a hold of them, write to them, implore them. If they refuse to turn to God, believe it or not, God does have a tendency to get out of office people who refuse him like he did with King Belshazzar. In the story of Daniel, I love this one because Daniel has a story of kings who turn to God and kings who refuse to go to God. King Belshazzar, we might remember, is the story where he's throwing a big massive party and he wants to rub it in God's face how epic he is. He's already got everything. He's the king of Babylon, the richest man in the world at the time. He's got all the treasures, all the girls, all the glory, all you could possibly want. And he's throwing a party and he tells his servant, he says, hey, why don't you go into our treasure chest, take all of the anointed cups that we stole from the temple of Israel that we might use them for this party. As if to say, I wanna give God, honestly, I wanna give God the middle finger right now, right here and right now. And as he's partying, he's drinking his wine, he's having a good time. As he's partying, the Bible records that he literally sees a hand from a ghost. It is just a ghost's hand and he's petrified. The Bible says he be, immediately began to shake and his face turned pale white. As he's watching this hand crawl up a wall, and begin to write on the wall, begin to write down the judgment that Belshazzar would face. Whoa, hello, okay, <laughs> we don't need it. <laughs> See you, Satan. <laughs> he said, writing down all the punishments on the wall that this king would face. And that same night, King Belshazzar died and the uh, Medes took over Babylon. Friends, I've gotta tell you, when you pray to God, put it in God's hands. Be active, implore God, write people, but God has a tendency to put in and out of power whom he wants and whom he wishes. That's why we have intercessory prayer. We can also never forget the power of praying over the future kings and authorities, our youth and our next generation. If this next generation, if their hearts can be turned towards God, then they can be the next William Wilberforce or, or a modern day Senator Josh Hawley or President Ronald Reagan. We could see all these people come back. There's no shortage of the good that can happen when we pray for the next generation. You see, when a generation turns its hearts to God, there's nothing it can't accomplish. In the Bible, one of my heroes is Joshua. Joshua in the Bible was a man who was Moses' protege. When Moses would come down from the mountain after staying with God, the Bible records Joshua would stay to pray and talk with God a little extra. Joshua and his generation wiped out 31 kingdoms, dynasties, strongholds. They took out the city of Jericho. They conquered all of these things. But before Joshua was a leader, there was a Moses generation who prayed over him and showed him the goodness of God. Friends, we always say, where's the Joshua generation? Where's the Joshua generation? Where's the generation that rises up and stands? Whom this day will you serve? Who speaks to culture? Friends, a Joshua generation can't happen without a Moses generation. Without a man who's willing to pray, without a woman who's willing to pray over the next generation and show them the way that you should go. If we wanna see a Joshua generation, then we need to see a revival of the Moses generation. Can I get an amen in the house of God? Come on, somebody, I know it's early. I know we had 21 days of prayer, I'm tired too, but I like to have fun and be vocal in church. You see, prayer frees and prayer saves because the prayers go up to Almighty God, the supreme judge of all earth. And he answers those prayers and send them back down to strengthen a generation to overcome the powers of hell. You see, there's nothing more powerful than prayer. Nothing more powerful than prayer. Point number two, point number two, prayer works. I just love this, it's so simple, prayer works, prayer works. Why do you pray? Because prayer works, <laughs> prayer works. In James 5, 16, James says, confess your faults to one another, pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So that was in the King James Version. That's why it was all old English. I just really liked how that sounded. I just love how they use the word availeth, availeth much, which is the same as accomplish. Some of the older words just hit different, right? They just add an extra layer of importance to them. 
But what James is saying is the prayers of a righteous person can accomplish many things. That's exactly what James said. That's exactly what scripture says. The prayers of someone who's righteous can and will accomplish many great things. There's a reason why we have a prayer team full of church elders and full of church leaders. They've demonstrated that they walk in righteousness and possess the Holy Spirit and they're a dependable group of people to ask for prayer to. It's not, it's not uncommon, it's not weird to go and have an altar team and, and talk to them for prayer. But what I love about God in the Bible is that if this verse is true in the positive, then the opposite must be true. The weak prayers of a sinner won't accomplish much at all. Not to say that God can't do anything, I won't ever limit God, but the weak, passive, faithless prayers of a sinner won't have any power since they aren't rooted in the authority of God. We pray because we're in control. We have authority. We're in control of our lives. We aren't Calvinist here. We believe that God knows all futures since he's all knowing, but he didn't choose it for us. We chose it ourselves. Our prayers can actually change the destiny of our lives because we're in control of our lives. The moment we find out the authority we possess is the moment we can take control of the current situation we're in and shape our future. Can I get an amen this morning? Can I get an amen? Come on, somebody. I'm reminded, probably one of my favorite stories on the subject of authority comes from a very famous general in World War II. I'm a big World War II history guy. You know anything about me? I love World War II history. But I'm reminded of the famous story of U.S. General Jonathan Wainwright. I've got another photo attached for it. Jonathan Wainwright was a general in World War II who was fighting against the Japanese in World War II. He lost the battle of the island of Corregidor uh, and surrendered it to the Japanese. He's the highest ranking officer to ever surrender in war from the US. And he's the highest ranking officer to ever surrender to the Japanese. And the Japanese took great pleasure in having him in the prisoner of war, the POW camp. History uh, retells that Jonathan Wainwright uh, was tr uh, beaten harsher than all the other uh, POW members because of his status. The Japanese wanted to rub it in his face that they won. Routinely, he would go on death marches, the baton death marches that would try and take people out. He was bullied, he was victimized, he was abused while he was in this camp because he had surrendered his position to the Japanese. But the story goes that he was surrendered in 1942 and three years he spent in the POW camp in World War II. Three years he spent in the POW camp. But three years while he's there, the United States of America had won the war. They finally defeated the Japanese forces after they dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Immediately, General MacArthur went to rescue Wainwright and other U.S. soldiers from the POW camp. Upon finding General Wainwright, uh, General MacArthur was almost in tears at how sickly, how thin, how beaten, how destroyed he was. The strong general he once knew who was willing to stand face to face with the enemy was just a shriveled man over all the abuse that he felt. He was just a weak, weak man. General Wainwright, upon seeing Douglas MacArthur, obviously knew what that had meant, that the U.S. had won the war, that authority had been given back to him. My favorite story, my favorite part about this whole story, it's the man who spent three years in a POW camp who was weak, who was disheveled, who was a shell of his former self, who went from having no authority. Watch this, what happens in his life. The story goes that he, upon hearing that they had won the war, General Wainwright walked right up to the Japanese commander who used to be in charge, and he explained to him that the U.S. has won the war. I'm in control here. You have to take orders from me. A weakened man was not only able to gain his strength but have complete authority over his enemy when he found out his team had won. Friends, our team has won. Come on, somebody. Our team has won the war. Jesus Christ defeated the powers of hell, the powers of sin, the powers of darkness. He's completely nullified Satan and diminished his power. We don't have to live in Satan's POW camp any longer since we have the authority of Jesus. When we pray, we pray from a position of victory, pray from a position of strength. You don't like something in your life, pray that God removes it and gives you strength to overcome it. Your last three years, your last one year, the end of 2023 might have been battles, might have been addictions, might have been temptations, might have been causing a lot of bruising and scarring. But the moment we understand that we have the authority, we can walk right up to that obstacle's face and say, I'm in control here. You get out of my life this instant. Come on, somebody. It's not just true in history. It's true in the scripture and spirit of God. Because we won the war. When we intercede, when we pray, prayer works because we've already won. Come on, somebody. We've already won. 
we can never forget that fact that we've already won the war. You see, prayer works because God works. Prayer still works today because God still works today. God isn't just the God of way back then. He's the God of here and now. What I love about John Wesley too is he, is he would pray for little things and he would say little things, he would see little things get answered because of his faith. John Wesley would be preaching while he was sick and he would pray for his cough to go away and it would. He'd be preaching in the heat of the day and he'd pray for clouds to cover him and they would. He would pray for that the rain stopped so he could travel to preach the gospel and the rain would stop. Seeing all these prayers answered and how God was willing to do any miracle, big or small, caused him to say, how much more proof do we need that there's no prayer too little or too great for God to answer? You don't just have to go to God when your life is in turmoil. You can go to God for a little request or a big request. He wants to hear them both because he wants to hear you. There's nothing that delights the heart of a father more than to hear their child. Every little prayer. Even prayers as simple as watching over your kids and family. I remember hearing in a sermon, a gosh, a while ago that really shook me to my core as I was gonna become a dad to my son, Joel. This, this woman who would just, you know, raised in a Christian home, she had two beautiful little girls and she would just pray every night, just pray every night. Father, I pray that you send your angels to watch over my babies. Keep them safe. Father, release the angels of heaven to guard my children as they go into the world. Every single night she prayed the prayer and she obviously believed it, but she wasn't going hyper spiritual and you know, putting all this stuff on. She just said the words to God. And one day she was driving her kids to school, the little drop off, little like U-shaped intersection, the kids get out, bye mom, right? They just do all that stuff. And one of the, the, the ladies was kind of controlling traffic was an ex-witch doctor. She was an ex-Satanist, an ex-person of the dark arts. And she, upon seeing these children, ran up, smacked her hands onto the hood of the mom's car. And the mom's like, oh goodness, what is happening? She's like, should I floor it? <laughs> should I run this person over? No. She's like, what's going on? And the woman said, what's different about your kids? And she's immediately thinking like, they are pretty good looking, handsome. I mean, look, that's just like every parent is, right? What's different about your kids? And she's like, well, what do you mean? She says, I have never seen kids with angels as big as them walking in. I've been here for as long as I'm, I'm an ex-witch doctor. I believe in the power of the spiritual realm. I've seen demons and angels. All these other kids walk in here with nothing, but your two children have angels. What calling is on their life? And the mom immediately was just like, what? I didn't know, like, <laughs> that's awesome. I guess they're anointed. And the word stuck with her. And the mom was driving home. The mom was driving home. And she talked to God. She said, God, how come my children had angels when no one else did? Do they truly have a different call? And God said, they have a call. But he said, the reason why your kids have these angels and none of the, none other kids do is because you're the only one who's asked. God convicted her in that moment so much to say, how many other things have I not asked God for? So many of us want protection, we want increase, we want breakthrough, we want our family to be strong, our family to know God, but we stopped asking. Perhaps not because we doubt the ability of God, but we just forget that God can do it. We don't disagree that God is all powerful, but we just forget sometimes that he wants to involve himself in life. He said, your children have angels because you asked. Friends, I've gotta tell you, there's no prayer too big or too small that you can't ask God. The power of prayer is real because life is real. Death is real. There's nothing more valuable than real life, than eternal life. We have a lot of people who are living but not living a full life. I'm more scared of not living a full life than I am of dying. Come on, somebody. Because when I die, I get to go to heaven. I got it good. I wanna capitalize on my life here and that involves talking to God. So point number three, the final point, if I could have the uh, keys come up right now, the final point. Point number three is intercession is the heart of God. Point number three is intercession is the heart of God. Why we encourage intercessory prayer, why we're teaching on it this morning, why we believe it's so powerful is because it's the heart of God. Isaiah 7, 14 is a verse that's oftentimes used to talk about the life and birth of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 7, 14 reads, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now, obviously, we know that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, but oftentimes we forget that his name, according to God, was Emmanuel. We call him Jesus, and Jesus is a powerful name, means the Lord saves. That's exactly what Jesus came to do. But Emmanuel is a Hebrew name that literally translates to God with us. God with us. What's funny about how Hebrew works is obviously their names all have meanings, right? Their names are all just words and meanings and descriptions of who they are. But Emmanuel 
Im anu el, it's three words in, in Hebrew. It's one of the shortest sentences in the Hebrew language. Im anu el, God is with us. But in Hebrew, it's more than a name. It's more than a sentence. Emmanuel is a declaration, a reality. The reality of Jesus. Jesus' very life on earth was this Hebrew sentence. You might think, how was Jesus' life a sentence? You're getting too philosophical this morning. Let me explain it. When Jesus was sorrowful, we can swap out the name Jesus for Emmanuel. It was Emmanuel in sorrow. But Emmanuel means God is with us. So we can say, God is with us in sorrow. When Jesus was on the boat in the Sea of Galilee in the midst of a storm, it was Emmanuel in the storm. God is with us in the storm. When Jesus is despised and rejected by mankind, it was Emmanuel in rejection. God is with us in rejection by mankind. When Jesus hung on the cross in judgment, it was Emmanuel in judgment. God is with us in judgment. When Jesus ascended to heaven where Jesus lives, it's Emmanuel forever. God is with us forever. You see, Emmanuel came into the world and to every circumstance of life so that we can say at all times and in all places, in all circumstances, Emmanuel. God's with us always. So many of us want to see God move. We cry out wondering, where is God? Why, why our life seems so distant, so powerless? The question isn't, where is God? But where are we? The question is not, where is God? But where are we? I remember the story my dad shared when I was little. My dad was just a big storyteller every night before bed and at dinner. He would, I don't know, he just would tell stories. It's like he had a quota to fill or something. He'd tell the story. And he told the story to me of when he first got saved. My dad didn't grow up in church. He grew up in an atheist home. My opa was a soldier on the Berlin Wall. He would shoot people if they tried to escape communism. He never had to shoot anybody trying to join communism. As funny as that sounds, they only wanted to escape. Come on, somebody. But he was a soldier on the Berlin Wall. He was an atheist. My dad grew up in an atheist home. He got saved at 18 on a beach because he joined a Christian surface pro amateur competition to get a wetsuit sponsor. That's why he did it. He didn't try and find Jesus, but Jesus found him. That's another story. So he gets saved at 18. He gets filled with the Holy Ghost at 19. He's starting to want to change his ways. He joins a church group, joins a small group, meets all these people in a small group. And he's thinking, oh my gosh, I can't wait for these people to love on me, grow me and shape me to be the disciple I want to be. And so he one night was out kind of just witnessing the people. He was out surfing. And after the surf, he was talking to people, telling about Jesus Christ, about the new life that he'd experienced. And he's walking by and he sees one of the old clubs that he used to go to before he was saved. He kind of heard the ns, ns, ns music. And he's like, ah, it reminds me of old times. He was walking by it and he saw the bouncer throw these two people out. Whew! He threw these two people out and there was these two men. And my dad's like, I know these guys. <laughs> there were two men from his small group. I won't say their names, but we'll just call them like Craig and Matthew. He's like, Craig, Matthew, what the heck? He's like, why are you guys thrown out of the club? And then he immediately saw how drunk they were. They got thrown out for indecency. And he picked them up and he said, guys, well, why are you doing this? Why, why are you still doing this lifestyle? I thought we were living the life for God. Craig and Matthew looked at my dad and said, oh, stop saying that. It's easy for you to live with God because God actually does stuff in your life. God actually moves, the Holy Spirit moves in your life. When you pray, people respond. When you talk to people, they listen. When we try and go with God, nothing happens. So what's the point? My dad, it was a new Christian. He was so shaken aback. He was so startled by what he had heard. He just kind of said, oh, okay. He kind of walked away and he spent time with God. He said, God, why? Why is that the case? Why is it that you favor me more than them? That, that doesn't seem fair. I see them in church. I see them believe. I see them tithe. I see them do all these things. Why is it that you're with me, but not them? And God said to my dad, his name's Jürgen. In the story, and it's just like in here, it says, Jürgs, I can move in your life because you've given me all your life. I want to move in their life, but there are pieces they haven't surrendered. He said, I gave all of me, but they haven't given me all of them. There are pieces in my life that, the pieces in their life that they've hidden, that they've removed, that they've not allowed me to touch. And because of that, it's placed a ceiling over what they can do. It's placed a ceiling over what I can do. He said to my dad, he said, because you've given all of you, you've received all of me. 
Friends, Jesus already came, died on the cross and rose again for you. Jesus already gave all of himself. The question now is, will you give all of you? Even those little areas you try to hide, little addictions, little lies, little grudges, little bitternesses. God won't be mad at you for them. He already knows you've done them, have them. But he will rejoice when you finally surrender them. Because now you've given him full access into your life. And he can do full miracles and full works for you. Friends, one thing I love about the fact that intercession is the heart of God, that Jesus' name was Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. The question of this whole earth, people are so desperate to find God, but the question after Jesus Christ came can never be, is God with us? The question can only ever be, are we with God? The question can never again be, God, do you love me? God, do you care for me? God, do you have a plan for me? God, do you see me? God, do you hear me? God, will you acknowledge me? The question only now is, well, are you with God? Are you speaking to God? Are you believing God? Are you surrendering all these things to God? Are you accepting God? Are you allowing God to lead you in your life? The question no longer can ever be, is God with us? But friends, the question to ask yourself this morning, are you with God? Is your family with God? Is your son with God? Is your daughter with God? Is your friend with God? Your brother, mother, father, are they with God? Is your boss with God? Is the city council member who's controlling your city with God? Are the people you see across the street with God? Are the people you brush in the marketplace, are they with God? The question no longer is God with them, but the question we have to think and put in our hearts is, are they with God? The reason why we come on a Sunday is not to hear me talk, not to see Pastor Brad, but to get filled again, to embrace yourself back to God. The reason why intercessory prayer is so important is because there are people who aren't with God. A lot of us know, in fact, all of us know a person who's not with God that we wish was. I have family who's not, who's far from God. But it doesn't stop me from praying. God, just get a hold of their life. God, I pray they finally surrender their heart. God, I pray that the moment that their heart is open, you're right there, you're right there waiting for them. One of the hidden names from God, a sermon I'm working on, is Is that that in, in the book of Jeremiah, God tells Jeremiah, he says, am I only a God close to hand? Am I not also a God far away? A hidden name from God is that he's the far away God. And I think that's weird. Why is God the far away God? Those who are far away, he's still their God. A prayer that you send far away, you send to a God who's far away. There's nothing too short, too far, or too impossible for God to answer. Friends, the question we have to think this morning Are we with God? Are they with God? If I could have everybody bow their heads and close their eyes this morning, we're gonna do two appeals. The first of which is, if you're in this place and you're not with God, perhaps there's pieces of your life that are with God, but there's pieces you've hidden. Perhaps you're wanting to dive into the full power of the Holy Ghost to move fully in the name of God, to see miracles, to see prayers get answered, and you're wondering why it's not, and you have to ask yourself the question, am I with God? Perhaps you once walked with God, and you drifted away. Perhaps you've wanted to believe, but you haven't yet. Friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, make that decision this morning to align yourself with God, to say that I'm with God. I'm gonna ask you something on the count of three. With every head bowed and every eye closed, why we do that is because we want this moment to be between you and the Lord. Because it's one thing to say it in your mind, but it's another thing to say it with your life. If you're in this house this morning and you're saying, I want to be with God, I want to put away the negative, put away the little things that I've hidden from God, and I want to make sure that I surrender to God. If that's you this morning, on the count of three, with every head bowed and every eye closed, lift up your hand so I know who to pray for this morning, so I can pray with you. On the count of three, one, two, three. Thank you right there. Thank you right there. Thank you right there. Come on, somebody. Thank you right there. Thank you. 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 Thank you right there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you at the back. Thank you right there. Thank you right there. Thank you in the balcony, all you people. Praise God. You can place your hands down. We're going to pray for you in a minute and just rejoice and love on you in a minute. But the second prayer request, the second plea I have this morning is as I was preaching, I said, there are people who aren't with God. 
Intercessory prayer is for us to stand and pray for other people on their behalf to God, to be their attorney in the eyes of God. Pastor Renee said it so beautifully. There are long shots in this room. I have a cousin who's, who's wrapped up in transgenderism. And I had forgotten to pray for him, not because I didn't believe God could heal him, but I just forgot if you're in this room and you've got a long shot that you want to pray for, if you're in this room and you know there's someone who's not with God that you know should be, whether it's a politician, a council member, a family member, a friend, or just someone the Holy Spirit put on your mind this week, on the count of three, keep your eyes closed, but lift up your hand, lift up your hand, and let me know there's someone I need to pray for. Let me join alongside you in that prayer. Thank you, thank you, thank you for these hands. Hands going up, hands going up. There are people with people who understand they need to be with God. Let these hands raised right now be a declaration in your heart that you say, I will continue to stand in the presence of God and pray for them that they might come to know God. Don't quit. Don't give up. Even when it's hard, don't give up when there's no fruit. Keep praying for God. Let me put those hands down. Everybody right now, we're gonna go over what's called the prayer of redemption for those who lift up their hands to say, I wanna be with God. It's called the sinner's prayer. I call it the prayer of redemption because we were sinners, but we were redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Everybody repeat after me. Everybody say, dear heavenly father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross, to intercede for my place. Lord Jesus, I choose to be with you. I choose to serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Come on, somebody, let's give a quick shout of praise. I want to continue to pray for those in this crowd this morning. When I said, if if you're believing and you understand, you want to pray for someone who's not with God, 80% of the room had their hands lifted. I would argue 20% of you who didn't have your hands lifted, you immediately thought of someone to pray for too. Join me in a prayer this morning. If I could have everybody stand up in the house of God this morning, we're going to close with this. Stand up in the house of God, do something different. We're going to end. This is the last day of 21 days of prayer. So Pastor Brad, I think I'm allowed to pray a tiny bit longer. Come on, somebody. I got the approval from Pastor Brad. That's all I need. (laughs) We're going to pray right now just for one minute, a declaration, an outpour to God to cry out that those who are far from God will encounter the faraway God. That those who are wondering and asking the question, is God with me, will now begin to realize, well, wait, am I with God? That those who were once distant, those who were once a long shot, will find themselves in the throne room of God's grace and accept Him as Lord and Savior. Everybody lift up your hands right now and join me in this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, I thank you, Lord, that you have placed burdens on these people's hearts, that you've placed names upon their minds of people who understand that they need to encounter the real love of God, that there are people and family and friends and strangers and encounters, God, and even politicians who need to know you. I'm praying that you will strengthen this crowd, that you will bless this crowd, you will anoint this crowd, that they will be the people to continue praying. They will get on their knees and they will not get off them until the prayer is answered, God. I thank you for the spirit of Jesus. John Wesley to fall upon this generation for the spirit of Moses to arise and create a new generation of Joshua's God I thank you Lord that no one is too far out of reach for the hand of God that no one is forgotten in the sight of God that as long as there's still breath inside of their lungs there's a chance they can return back to the house of God and we'll keep praying Father I pray that you strengthen them right now the verse I have for this crowd Do not grow weary in doing what is good. Paul said, do not grow weary in praying. Do not grow weary in standing strong. Do not give up even when it seems hard. Continue to pray and believe that they'll find God. If you agree with that this morning, give Jesus Christ a big shout of praise. Come on, somebody.